Welcome back to the class video for Module 2. We left off at the end of Chapter 3 on the State of War, and as we look at the last three chapters of the reading assignment for Module 2, we really have two big concepts that we want to cover. Property and the relationships of the household. But as we look at the chapter headings for chapters 4, 5, and 7, we see a little bit of an odd sequencing of topics. Chapter 4 is on slavery, chapter 5 is on property, and chapter 7 is titled on civil society, but the first half or more of that chapter is devoted to describing the relationships of the household. Well, of course, one of the most prominent and important relationships within the household is the master-slave relationship. So we have a little bit of an odd sequencing of topics talking about slavery and then property and then coming back to the household. So let's go ahead and skip over chapter 4 momentarily, turn to chapter 5, let's talk about uh, property rights, and then we'll come back and we'll look at chapter 4 and chapter 7 together. Locke begins chapter 5 with what he considers to be the foundational conceptual dilemma with how uh, we come to own property. He writes, whether we consider natural reason, which tells us that men, being once born, have a right to their preservation, and consequently to meat and drink and such other things as nature affords for their subsistence, or revelation, which gives us an account of those grants God made of the world to Adam and to Noah and his sons. It is very clear that God, as King David says, has given the earth to the children of men, given it to mankind in common. But this being supposed, it seems to some a very great difficulty how anyone should ever come to have a property in anything. So for Locke, the key definitional criteria, the key conceptual element when we talk about property is the capacity of any one individual to claim some portion of nature to the exclusion of the rest of the commons. And this is a fundamental problem for Locke because he takes it as affirmed by scripture. And indeed, one of the most sort of commonsensical ideas of the world that he lived in, that all men have an equal claim to the bounty that God has provided for us. If we all have an equal claim, if we are all equally the, the children of God and God has given us the world for our sustenance, how is it then that any one of us can look at some piece of nature and say to the rest, you may not have this, this is mine. Now this idea about property is so idiosyncratically and uniquely Lockean. All right, when we look at uh, Rousseau in modules four and five, we'll see a very different idea about property. And certainly this is a radically new idea in the 17th century. This is not, uh, at the same time, that it is uniquely and sort of idiosyncratically Locke's version of property, there's perhaps no psychological understanding of what we mean when we say property that is more common in the modern world, that is more at the root of global commerce and global liberalization and all the rest, than this idea that what property is, is a right of exclusion. Right, that when we say I own something, what we fundamentally are claiming in that claim of ownership is the right to tell others no. Hopefully you will see how this corresponds to that negative conception of freedom or negative freedom that we saw in chapter 2 on the state of nature. For Locke, freedom is fundamentally about the ability to not have others mess with your business, right? To interfere with your ordering of your actions. It's not an empowerment to accomplish any particular thing, but it's a right to prevent others from interfering with your choices. So there's an analog concept here of property. 
that property is the capacity to exclude others, to, uh, to prevent them from interfering with your uh, application of resources or employment of resources. That seems so intuitively obvious to us because it is the conception of property that pervades our modern culture. But in the 17th century and for millennia preceding, a much more conventional, traditional, pre-modern or pre-capitalist way of thinking about property is rather to think about the individual's claim to participate in the commons. Right? That when I say that I own something, what I'm saying is, yes, I'm a member of the commons, uh, pardon me while I take my share that I need. Or in an alternative way of thinking about that, uh, uh, if you think about sort of the lord owning all the land that the serfs work on, or the king uh, formally legally owning all the property in the realm, and each individual person merely using that property by leave of the king or the sovereign authority, which is a very kind of medieval or classical way of thinking about property ownership. Well, what property means in that context, if you are the duke or you're the lord or the earl or the king, is your property right is your obligation to take care of the people, the members of the commons, who are living and subsisting on the land that you have ownership over. So it's not at all conceived of as a right of exclusion, but an obligation to share and distribute and to sustain all. Property is conceived primarily as a kind of obligation of power and authority in society. But of course, Locke imagines that we exist fundamentally as individuals in the state of nature. He doesn't imagine that we belong to a community. And so our rights are derived from our natural state. And it's from the individual that Locke is going to begin to construct his model of property ownership. There is one thing that Locke knows for certain that we each own our bodies. So he writes at the top of the left-hand column on page 9, Though the earth and all inferior creatures be common to all men, yet every man has a property in his own person. This nobody has any right to but himself. The labor of his body and the work of his hands, we may say, are properly his. Whatsoever then he removes out of the state, of na the state that nature hath provided and left it in, he hath mixed his labor with and join to it something that is his own, and thereby makes it his property. I know that I own my body to the exclusion of the commons because when I tell my arms and my legs and my hands and my feet, uh, go grab the hoe, hoe up the ground, plant seed, uh, weed and water, harvest in the fall, when I command my legs and arms and hands and feet to do those things, I know that they're going to listen to me and not to the commands of others because I have my free will, my agency, right? The thing that commands myself and makes decisions. I know that it has a direct control over my body. And that's the model for Locke of ownership, to have that control or command. Now what's wonderful about this idea, or ironic about this idea, is that while it's a radically libertarian notion of individual property rights, this, these passages in this part of chapter 5 describe what becomes known as the labor theory of value, and the labor theory of value is this foundational to sort of lefty, progressive, Marxist, communist interpretations of social contract theory as it is to sort of righty, libertarian, capitalist interpretations. Marx loves the labor theory of value, that is, that it's the workers who create all the real value in society, and all those dirty capitalists are kind of parasites that just suck value out of uh, the work done by the laborers. So this uniquely and idiosyncratically Lockean idea really becomes the foundation of 19th and early 20th century political economy.
and it's so easily accessible because Locke gives us such a simple metaphor. It's so easy to conceptualize the description of the necessity of private ownership. He describes in the next paragraph, he that is nourished by the acorns he picked up under an oak or the apples he gathered from the trees in the wood has certainly appropriated them to himself. Nobody can deny, but the nourishment is his. I ask then, when did they begin to be his? When he digested? Or when he eat? Or when he boiled? Or when he brought them home? Or when he picked them up? And it is plain, if the first gathering made them not his, nothing else could. That labor put a distinction between them and the common. That added something to them more than nature, the common mother of all had done. And so they became his private right. This kind of metaphor or parable about the origins of property is so easy to comprehend. We can imagine walking in the woods and being hungry and coming up on an apple tree, grabbing an apple. And certainly in modern society, you can, oh, the farmer is going to sue me. This is the farmer's orchard. But in a world without laws, in a world without government or only natural laws, that this is a moral act. It's a moral act to satisfy the hunger of your body by grabbing an apple from a tree in the woods. For Locke, this is not an act of covetousness or you know, a desire to be rich or to make distinctions between yourselves and others. It's an act of compulsion that we're, we're compelled to grab the apple from the tree in the woods because if we don't, we'll die, right? He says, uh, he writes, if such a consent as that was necessary, man had starved, notwithstanding the plenty God had given him. God created me as both a decision-making machine, right, with a, with a will and an ability to command my arms and legs, he also made me a machine that consumes nutrients. And if I don't replace those nutrients, I'll defeat God's work in creating me. And we'll skip ahead here because there's such a wonderful passage that encapsulates that idea of the compulsory nature, nature of property. I don't want to create property, but if I don't do it, I'll die. And clearly God created me as a creature that desires to exist, right? With a free will to act on that desire. So here at the bottom of the right-hand column of page 10, or this middle paragraph, this passage really beautifully summarizes that Lockean value. Locke writes, the law man was under was rather for appropriating. God commanded, and his wants forced him to labor. That was his property, which could not be taken from him wherever he had fixed it. And hence, subduing or cultivating the earth and having dominion, we see are joined together. The one gave title to the other, so that God, by commanding to subdue, gave authority so far to appropriate. And the condition of human life, which requires labor and materials to work on, necessarily introduces private possessions. God requires private property in order to see the fulfillment of his own creation. This is why property is the most foundational of all the natural rights. We'll see when we get to chapter seven, you have to give up most of your natural rights in order to re, uh, gain protection for the most fundamental natural rights of those property is by far the most preeminent. Now, despite the metaphor being so simple and easy to comprehend, kind of innately intuitive, there are any number of critical questions or objections that can be proposed to this model if we return back to the image of the man in the state of nature grabbing the apple from the tree. We'll see in module four when we get to Rousseau that Rousseau's kind of essential critique of this description of where property comes from, uh, Rousseau might say, Locke asks, at what point did, it, did the apple become the man's property? Locke, uh, Rousseau would respond, 
Well, they could have been his property the minute he went and asked all the neighbors in the area, do you mind if I take an apple from the tree? And if the neighbors all said, sure, go ahead, take an apple from the tree, at that moment, that apple would become his property. If the man simply takes the apple from the tree and eats it, that apple and, and sort of uh, digests the nutrients, the nutrients of the apple become a part of the person. You could say that the man possesses the apples, but not that the apples are his property. Because when we use that word property, we mean a kind of titled or principled possession of a valid, legitimate possession of. And for Rousseau, that can only come from the acknowledgement of the commons. Only the commons can confer a legitimate possession of something. Otherwise, you're just grabbing stuff, and you can grab stuff that belongs to other other people. That's essentially the Rousseauian critique, and we'll come back to that and look at that in more detail in a couple of modules. The other objection that seems sort of intuitively obvious and the one that Locke is primarily going to want to deal with here in chapter 5 is, well, sure, no problem if you want to take an apple from the tree, but by taking an apple from the tree, can you thereby claim ownership of the tree? That is to say, can you exclude others from also grabbing an apple simply because you're hungry and want an apple? It seems... Uh, a logical extension of the metaphor, that is to say, if all I have to do is apply my labor to something, when I took the apple from the tree, didn't I apply my labor to the tree? And if something more is required of me, then I'll, you know, uh, pick weeds off of the ground around the tree. I'll spray pesticides on the tree and keep insects away from it, right? In some way, I'll apply my labor to the tree itself. Well, then I own the tree. And my ownership, my property claim, entails the right to exclude others from the tree. If I can do that to one tree, why can't I do that to every tree in the orchard? Why don't I corner the market on apples in the state of nature? Right? What are the limits to my accumulation of property? And it's that kind of objection, which is sort of the innately capitalist right, response to the Lockean model here. It's that objection that Locke is primarily concerned with. So he writes at the bottom of the right-hand column of page 9, it will perhaps be objected to this, that if gathering the acorns or other fruits of the earth and such makes a right to them, then anyone may engross as much as he will. To which I answer, not so. The same law of nature that does by this means give us property does also bound that property too. God has given us all things richly, is the voice of reason confirmed by inspiration. But how far has he given it to us to enjoy? As much as anyone can make use of to any advantage of life before it spoils, so much he may by his labor fix a property in. Whatever is beyond this is more than his share and belongs to others. So there is a limit embedded in natural law on our capacity to accumulate. This is sometimes referred to as the law of spoilage or the law of waste because of that line, make use of to any advantage of life before it spoils. So you can claim the tree if you got five kids back at home and, this, and a partner and the whole family has to be fed as long as you're not taking more apples than you need to sustain your life. And that this is imposed by the same law that imposes poses all uh, of natural laws, that is, the law of reason. It is rational for you to be limited by the needs that are compulsory on you, that were imposed on you by God or nature. So there is the same tension here with property as we saw with all natural rights between chapters 2 and 3. That is to say, yes, you're endowed with freedom. Yes, you're endowed with equality and every other conceivable right. But it's not without limit. It necessarily has to have a qualifying function. 
And here the qualifying function or the delimiting factor is that the thing that gives rise to your right, your hunger, your need to sustain the kind of machine that, that God embedded you in, is the limit of your right. Once you've satisfied that necessity, you can make no additional claim. So in so many ways, property is the premier or the focal point for the primary metaphor for the dilemma of all natural rights, except we see that it is unique in having this kind of perversion or corruption that Locke describes at the very end of the chapter. So if we skip past the compulsory, God made us, here we come to page 11, and if we look at this highlighted passage uh, on the left-hand column, Locke writes, but be this as it will, which I lay no stress on, this I dare boldly affirm, that the same rule of propriety or rule of reason, that every man should have as much as he could make use of, would still hold in the world without straightening anybody, since there's land enough in the world to suffice double the inhabitants, had not the invention of money and the tacit agreement of men to put a value on it, introduced by consent, larger possessions, and a right to them. Now this refers to an issue that is very prominent in the politics of the 17th century, especially the second half of the 17th century. This is really the origins of modern currency and money in Western Europe. It's a, a, it's a kind of a parallel related economic development, but it's one that Locke happens to be deeply involved with because he's a member of parliament and they're dealing with legislation. And in essence, he's, a, he's an opponent of, of currency and he doesn't like the underlying economic principles. But notice that unlike the other rights, there is this kind of trick that men have been able to pull off. That is, uh, yes, I'm limited in the number of apples that I can take from the tree. If I take so many apples and bring them home that they start to rot in my barn, then I am in violation of the law of nature Every person in nature is empowered to enforce that law, so anybody would have a right to come take the apples out of my barn. That would not hold true if I'm able to turn those apples into gold coins, because of course gold and silver coins do not rot, and so I can accumulate vastly beyond uh, my needs and not violate the law of waste or the law of spoilage. This is the subversion of the egalitarian elements of Locke's property theory. So let's turn now and summarize the fundamental concepts here. For Locke, the natural law of property is the empowerment of the individual to claim private dominion to the exclusion of the commons or the claims of others to the resources of nature, and that this derives from the way God made us. God made us with a compulsion to appropriate from nature merely to sustain our own human life. At the root of this theory is a radically egalitarian idea or a qualitarian idea. Every one of us who has a free will, who possesses agency, who controls our own bodies, then has the root right or the root capacity to create property and to claim ownership. The problem, of course, is what are the limits of that, and that's imposed by the law of waste. And notice Locke's assumption in this final passage that we shared. Locke assumes that there would be plenty of resources in the world if it were not for some taking more than they need. Locke lives in a world of inexhaustible supply. In other words, Locke lives in a world radically different than the one we live in, where we are hyper-conscious at uh, each one of our own consumptive appetites comes at the expense that there are not enough natural resources for the global population. That is a world that would be utterly alien to Locke and indeed any of the writers that we're going to look at this semester. It's really one of the defining features of our modern psychology that would just be alien in Locke's world. Now, the dilemma 
posed by property rights is in many ways uh, just like the dilemma posed by all natural rights. That is to say, your exercise of your rights in the state of nature is precisely the problem or the engine that drives us into the state of war. It's that you get to decide for yourself what is and is not yours, right? And the problem of self-love and how that perverts your judgment and corrupts your reason so that you can't uh, objectively enforce the law of nature. That dilemma is true of all rights, but as we're going to see in chapter 7, of all your natural rights, Locke says that the one right that you absolutely must be able to bring with you into civil society, you're going to have to surrender all of your other rights or the majority of your other rights, but the one right that government must recognize and protect and defend is your property right. Now, in many ways, as we've just seen, of all the rights you can imagine in the state of nature, it is property that is the thing that is most driving people into conflict. That is to say, if going beyond your needs is so easy because of the creation of money and it's a violation of the natural law and us competing over the apple tree is one of the surest ways to bring us into conflict in the state of nature, why in the world would government guarantee that right? It was one of the most corrosive and cancerous rights in the state of nature. Now, it is the most compulsory, right? It's the, it's your hunger. You will indeed die. You may not die if you don't get to exercise your freedom of speech. You will die if you don't get to exercise your freedom of property, right? From a Lockean perspective, that's the way Locke sees it. So it is the foundational right but it is also the right that most drives us into conflict and necessitates the creation of government and the surrender of our natural rights. There is no resolution to this dilemma from the Lockean view. It's that unresolvable paradox that's going to lead Rousseau into a very different construction of what property is, and it's because he's trying to avoid exactly this problem. That's the law of property in Locke. It is one of the most idiosyncratic, unique, identifying characteristic of the Lockean approach to the social contract, and at the same time, one of the most foundational psychological premises of our modern conception of property. Let's turn now and look at the other major concept in the last half of the reading for Module 2, slavery and the household. Returning to chapter 4 of slavery, then, with an understanding of Locke's theories about the natural law of property, we have a basis for appreciating the profound contradiction, a paradox, dilemma posed by slavery to Locke's version of the social contract, his theory of natural liberty. If our most fundamental right, the thing that is most sort of hardwired into us by the natures of the creatures that we are is to apply our labor to the resources of nature to appropriate from it to sustain our own existence, how then could there ever be a legitimate form of slavery? Doesn't slavery obviously contradict the most fundamental principles of Locke's theory of natural equality and property rights? And aren't those things the foundation of Locke's theory? Now, slavery is a prominent issue in Locke's world in the second half of the 17th century. Uh, you may know that Britain largely began its colonial enterprise relying primarily on white indentured uh, servants as their form of labor in the colonies, and that at some point they converted over to primarily to African slave labor. That conversion happens right in the course of Locke's lifetime, and there are important pieces of legislation that come through Parliament while Locke is a member of Parliament. Indeed, he's an investor in uh, 
colonies, sugar colonies, and rice colonies in Carolina and in Barbados. And so he is sort of secondhand directly implicated. He's not himself directly a slave owner, but he is invested in operations that use slave labor. So he's sort of a secondhand owner of slaves. Uh, that tension, that cultural, political problem of late 17th century England and the conversion, kind of the legalization, the codification of slavery in just this period is evident in the way Locke treats the subject. If we come to page eight, and if you read chapter four and you couldn't quite figure out what Locke thought about slavery, whether he thought it was okay or it was not okay, then you are exactly reading the chapter correctly. Locke is in tension with himself, contradicting himself. He can't quite resolve what he thinks. When we get to Rousseau in a couple of weeks, you'll see a much clearer and unequivocal denunciation of slavery. In Rousseau's presentation, slavery can never be legitimate. It can never be based on a right. And he sort of falls over himself, trying to repeat again and again in more dramatic, absolute terms just how... Uh, nonsensical, illogical, the very concept of a right to own slaves is. What we find in Locke is a writer in tension with himself. If we look at this first full paragraph, the first paragraph of chapter four so describes our natural liberty, and then if we come to the first full paragraph on the left-hand column of page eight, Locke writes, this freedom, meaning natural freedom, this freedom from absolute arbitrary power is so necessary to and closely adjoined with a man's preservation that he cannot part with it but by what forfeits his preservation and life together. For a man not having the power of his own life cannot by compact or his own consent enslave himself to anyone. Now that seems like a pretty clear and unequivocal denunciation of slavery. A man cannot ever enslave himself to anyone. Now, when Locke writes that man not having the power of his own life, you may, that's a kind of curious phrase to modern readers. What he's referring to here is suicide, right? That it can never be in Locke's world, 17th century England. Uh, suicide is one of the most grievous sins that you can commit. And so what he's claiming is, you don't have the power to end your own life, therefore you could never by consent or compact enslave yourself to another person. You don't possess the power, uh, the right to give over your life to someone else. Now that seems like a clear and unequivocal denunciation of slavery. It's simply not possible. But in the very next highlighted passage, Locke writes, indeed, having by his fault forfeited his own life by some act that deserves death, he to whom he has forfeited may, when he has him in his power, delay to take it and make use of him to his own service, and he does him no injury by it. Now this seems to justify slavery, and it takes us back to chapter 3, remember, uh, we are each, I'm sorry, chapter 2, we are each responsible for enforcing the law of nature. And when we see violations of the law of nature by our own judgments, we may enforce punishment. If we judge that someone has violated the law of nature in such a way that they deserve to be killed, and we engage in a battle and you disarm them and, and have the ability to kill them, you do have the right to take their life at that point, and you may bargain. Give me your freedom, and I will give you your life back. And you do that person no injury because you were fully justified in killing them. Now, hold on. This is the very same paragraph, right? Where Locke has seemingly just said, you can't enslave yourself to anyone. He turns right around and says, but you have done him no injury by it. What's going on? Well, the following paragraph does very little to clarify the situation. He writes, This is the perfect condition of slavery, which is nothing else but the state of war continued between a lawful conqueror and a captive. For if once compact enter between them, and they make an agreement for a limited power on one side and obedience on the other, the state of war 
and slavery ceases as long as the compact endures. So this is the perfect condition of slavery until the moment that the slave agrees to that condition and at the moment of agreement and consent it's no longer slavery. It's very difficult to figure out what Locke is trying to describe here other than he is twisted into a knot because of the conceptual problems posed by slavery to his theory of natural equality. What's really going on here is that Locke is trying to define a new category of slavery from the one called the chattel principle to which virtually everyone in 17th century and virtually all pre-modern Europe, Western uh, culture would have thought of slavery as within. So let's turn and look at that comparison. So what Locke is describing here is a new justification or rationalization or legal codification of the institution of slavery that is really a characteristic of the modern imperial enterprise. That is to say, slavery is an ancient institution, but it's codified and rationalized under a whole variety of different ideologies. Uh, Locke is not unique in this argument, uh, but it, it, these are sort of famous passages because he condenses it just down to those two paragraphs and you can see the contradictions so clearly. What's preserved in Locke's version of the origins of slavery, of course, is our natural liberty. In other words, the, the existence of a slave does not contradict the foundational principle of natural equality because the slave, through their own volition, through their own free will, uh, engaged in behavior through which they forfeited that liberty. Right? So slavery can be reconciled with uh, the existence of natural equality. This is radically different than the ancient rationalization and, and, and the justification for slavery that would have been evident to most people in pre-modern Europe. And it's called the chattel principle, again articulated in many sources, but sort of famously associated with its description in Aristotle's politics. And Aristotle gives two definitions of what the slave is. Uh, he at one point describes the slave as a tool. He says, a slave is anyone who, despite being human, is by nature not his own, but someone else's property, a tool for action. So the key thing here is by nature not his own, that is lacking free will, lacking the ability to direct their own behavior. The tool is like a shovel, right? Uh, it's an instrument for action. The shovel can't decide what to do on its own. It requires someone else to take possession of it and to put it to use. And so the key idea here is, of course, Aristotle is very comfortable with the idea of natural inequality. Aristotle does not believe that all men are born naturally equal, right? And so this is a description of the fundamental different categories. Now, Aristotle would have, if you remember your readings from Foundation, even if you had the ethics, Aristotle would have said that slaves have fundamentally different souls, right? and that's how he would have explained it. But he also gives an alternate explanation, which is not quite a negation of being a tool, but is slightly different. Uh, he also describes the slave as a beast, he writes. Those people who are as different from others as body is from soul or beast from human are natural slaves. And here the idea is a little bit different. Slaves might be people, right? They might be species human, but they're people who don't have a capacity to use their reason. They're sort of lost and aimless people. Uh, they're people who would not know to store up nuts in the fall to get them through winter. And if they didn't ha uh, come into partnership with another human being whose primary utility, maybe they're weak and, and scrawny and they're not their body is not particularly strong, right? But what they have is their reason and their capacity to think. And so 
uh, there's a natural union, there's a natural partnership, Aristotle believes, between those people whose primary utility is their body and those people whose primary utility is their mind. Uh, they come together and they form a natural partnership. So for Aristotle, you know, he readily concedes there are plenty of people forced into slavery who are not natural slaves. They don't deserve to be slaves. That's not their true nature. But he does believe that there are human beings whose inner nature is to be a slave. When they are a slave, it is the fulfillment of what they were meant to be or what they're capable of being. So a slave is a natural element of the community. The slave is not some reject, right? The slave is not, uh, they're lesser than, but they're a necessary part of, as opposed to Locke's version where the slave is a, they are human, but they're an errant human, right? They have the capacity to reason, but maybe in excess and they have, and it's corrupted them, right? And so they violated the natural law. At the root of Aristotle's concept of slavery or the classical or ancient or chattel conception of slavery, the slave is a form of property. And indeed, that's where that word chattel comes from. It's a category of English law in which uh, what's known as movable or living property, uh, that is cows and horses and chickens and sheep and whatnot. Uh, when you have a lawsuit around that, there's a whole body of English law that describes that as chattel property. And that is the category that slaves get put into when slaves are initially codified in British law that slaves are a species of property. But of course, that contradicts Locke's doctrine of natural equality. So what we see him doing in chapter four is trying to come up with a different explanation of why slavery could be legitimate. We're not gonna call it slavery once they consent to it, but how it could be valid and yet reconciled to his doctrine of natural equality. That's why chapter four is so contradictory. And we wanna hang on to this paradox. It's indeed where we're gonna end the semester when we look at the Federal Constitutional Convention and the debate around representation. We will see exactly this paradox or conceptual contradiction between thinking of slaves as property or slaves as people was one of the most uh, controversial and divisive issues in the Federal Constitutional Convention. For our purposes here, the slave is the building block of a broader paradigm that Locke wants to create for you, thinking about the division between household relationships and political or civic relationships. If you recall the introduction in chapter one, he thought that was the foundational element you had to understand to grasp political authority correctly. So let's turn now to chapter seven and look at these descriptions of these household relationships. Arriving then at the final chapter of the assigned reading for module two and understanding the paradox or the contradiction that slavery poses to Locke's theory of natural equality and the kind of belabored, not quite convincing attempt to reconcile those principles, we can appreciate here in the final chapter that slavery is merely the most prominent or obvious or explicit example of a much broader problem with Locke's theory of natural equality. How can he justify every form of inequality that he sees in his contemporary society, which he assumes is valid, and how can he justify that against the backdrop of his claim that we are all born with natural equality. So we are brought right back to chapter one. Here with chapter, the introduction of chapter seven, we're brought right back to chapter one. Remember that Locke told us the fundamental error that Sir Robert Filmer made in his book, uh, Patriarcha, uh, was the argument that the rule of a father over his family was the model of political authority, how a king should rule over his subjects. And we are brought directly back to that comparison here in the first paragraph of chapter seven, Locke writes, God having made man such a creature, 
that in his own judgment it was not good for him to be alone, put him under strong obligations of necessity, convenience, and inclination to drive him into society, as well as fitted him with understanding and language to continue and enjoy it. The first society was between man and wife, which gave beginning to that between parents and children, to which, in time, that between master and servant came to be added. And though all these might, and commonly did, meet together and make up but one family, wherein the master or mistress of it had some sort of rule proper to a family, each of these, or all together, came short of political society as we shall see if we consider the different ends, ties, and bounds of each of these. So, the rule of the household, the rule of the father over the family, is fundamentally different than political authority, than civil society, the principles that justify the way a father rules. It's not that they're invalid principles, they just only apply to these relationships and they don't apply to political relationships. Right? That's the fundamental distinction that we were introduced to in chapter one and after the depiction of the state of nature as we're preparing to get a description of political society, uh, we're brought right back to that first principle again. And the first half of chapter seven is gonna essentially walk through each of the four primary relationships within the family. The first and the one he spends the most time on, primarily because he already discussed slavery, is the relationship between man and woman or husband and wife. He writes in the next paragraph, conjugal society is made by a voluntary compact between man and woman. And though it consists chiefly in such a communion and right in one another's bodies as is necessary to its chief end, procreation, Yet it draws with it mutual support and assistance and a communion of interest too, as necessary not only to unite their care and affection, but also necessary to their common offspring, who have a right to be nourished and maintained by them till they are able to provide for themselves. So at the heart of the relationship between man and woman is a voluntary compact or consent. There is a a quality between them. They are each required to consent to make conjugal society valid and legitimate, and they are both bound by the limits of that union, that is, the obligation imposed on them by their offspring. So we get this uh, description of viviparous animals and deers in the, <laughs> in the woods, and Locke's argument is that it is natural in our biology. It's, it's unique to human biology. It's a, it's a sort of accident of our creation that we happen to make lifelong unions because our offspring are essentially helpless and require our sustenance for such a long period of time until they're able to take care of themselves that the result of that is we are virtually bound for our adulthoods together. So the, the perpetuity of the union between the man and the woman is not the result of man imposing it on woman, but is a mutuality of our unique human biology. This does not sound like feminism, uh, and certainly is not by 21st century standards, but by the standards of the 17th century, this is a remarkably egalitarian portrait of the power relationship between men and women. It's nevertheless true that men will have to be in charge and that there are natural differences between them in the highlighted passage on the right hand column of 13. But the husband and wife, though they have but one common concern, yet having different understandings will unavoidably sometimes have different wills too. It therefore being necessary that the last determination, i.e. the rule, should be placed somewhere it naturally falls to the man's share as the abler and the stronger. But this reaching but to things of their common interest and property leaves the wife in full and free possessions of what by, her, by contract is her peculiar right and gives the husband no more power over her life than she has over his. Now you could take this exact same principle well, the rule has to follow somewhere, so let's put it in one person's hands. Let's give it to the naturally, the abler and the stronger. 
That rule does not apply to politics, as we are about to see. Everyone gets a vote in politics. So there are natural differences between men and women, and men are naturally dominant from Locke's point of view, from the 17th century point of view. But notice how limited that dominance is. It's merely because it's necessary to resolve the conflict, and it extends no more than what is their common interest, that is primarily their children and their, the, and their property, right? What, what gives them sustenance. In 17th century terms, this is a radically feminist or egalitarian interpretation of the relationship between genders. It is remarkably libertarian uh, in, in context. We'll get to the mid-19th century before we'll see similar uh, expressions of equality between men and women. So there's natural subordination, though near equality. That subordination intensifies the further down you go in the household relationships. So if we come to page 14 on the left-hand column in the highlighted passages, right? the society between parents and children and the distinct rights of powers belonging respectively, respectively to them, I have treated of so largely in the foregoing chapter that I shall not here need to say anything of it. I think it's plain that it's far different from a politics society. Uh, he's referring to chapter 6, which I did not assign you, and chapter 6 is really a summary of the first treaties, the rights of patriarchy. The thing about the rule of parents over children, it is, it is more extreme than the rule of husband over wife, because there's near equality, and of course children aren't able to care for themselves, but it's bound by two things. It's bound by time, because children will become adults and have autonomy, so the power uh, only extends for a certain period of time, for a certain duration. And it's also bound by the natural affection, Locke argues, that parents have for their children, which limits the extremity of that power. So, uh, more extreme, inequality than between husband and wife or man and, and woman, but still not anything like slavery. Now we come to the next paragraph. Master and servant are names as old as history, but given to those of far different condition. For a free man makes himself a servant to another by selling him for a certain time the service he undertakes to do in exchange for wages he is to receive. If you did read Aristotle's Politics and Foundations, uh, you might remember that these uh, vulgar craftsmen were a cru crucial category for Aristotle. He could never quite figure out uh, if he could trust them or not, or if they should be part of his democracy. That's what uh, that idea is categorized here by Locke uh, as servant. So essentially, anyone who is free but sells their labor to another in exchange for wages. In 17th century conceptions, I own your labor. Your labor is my property. So there is an approximation of slavery there. That is to say, uh, if you work for somebody in the 17th century, you are not free to quit and walk off the job and go get a different job. You have sold that person your labor, and they have a contractual right, legally enforceable right, to demand of you and even to coercively punish you, right? To whip you or any other punishment that the law prescribes to compel you to labor for them because you have sold them your labor. So it's very different than modern conceptions of, of free labor. And so it's a subordinate status. But again, the root of the, of the relationship is a free person. They have chosen to do this. And there is at least the parameters imposed by the law. Right? So the law can intervene between a master and a servant if the master is abusing their contractual rights. Finally, we come to the category of slavery, which we've just covered. There's another sort of servants, which by a peculiar name we call slaves, who being captives taken in a just war, are by right of nature subjected to the absolute dominion and arbitrary power of their masters. So the slave is the lowest form of, or, or the form of greatest inequality within the household, the, 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 the form of maximal authority of the master of the household over the relations within the household. We've already talked about that. 
So the summation here, let us therefore consider a master of a family with all these subordinate relations of wife, children, servants, and slaves, united under the domestic rule of a family which, what resemblance soever it may have in its order, offices, and number two, with a little commonwealth, yet it is very far from it, both in its constitution, power, and end. And this then is the kind of hinge point of the entire text. Locke has introduced political society by telling us what political society is not. And what is political society not? All the forms of subordination that Locke perceives as being natural and normal. So let's turn now and look at this dichotomy. And so in Locke's model of the social contract, which you did not see if you read Hobbes' Leviathan, and we'll see the absence of, we'll note the absence of when we get to Rousseau's on social contract. In Locke's unique model of the social contract, there is a fundamental opposition between household or domestic authority and political or civil authority. They are the antitheses of each other. Household relationships are based on natural dependency or natural inequality. Admittedly along a spectrum where husband and wife are nearly equal and lord and slave are antitheses of each other in their equality statuses, but each one of these relationships is rooted in the inner nature, the, the true human nature of the role player, right? So the wife, the child, the servant, and the slave, each in different ways, are naturally dependent on the husband, the parent, the master, and the Lord. And they are able to consent to the degree that they have a capacity to consent. So the wife, virtually completely so, uh, almost indistinguishable from the capacity of the husband's uh, ability to consent, the child less so, the servant slightly less so, and the slave least of all performing the dominant role in each of these relationships, being the husband, being the parent, being the master, being the Lord, exercising, in other words, household mastery is what demonstrates your capacity, is, is what proves your credentials to move over into the political realm and exercise what we're going to call civic agency. So there is a contradiction, there is a hypocrisy at the foundation of Locke's interpretation or proposal or paradigm for the social contract model. You may be more familiar in American history with a more simple illustration of that same foundational conceptual paradox or contradiction. Uh, it is iconographic in American political culture to focus on the role of Thomas Jefferson or the, the position of Thomas Jefferson who was simultaneously a slave owner and also the author of the most uh, iconic words in American political life. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain in inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. How could the author of those words also be the author of a runaway slave advertisement, as you see on your screen, and to demand the return of his human property. This is the one of the conceptual paradoxes that lays at the foundation of American political culture. And of course we have a whole spectrum of political views of how to reconcile in our mind that contradiction. We're going to leave the discussion here for now, and we're going to pick up with the middle of Chapter 7 at the start of Module 3, because Locke is going to start in the middle of Chapter 7, his description of civil society as the antithesis of household or domestic authority. So we'll leave the discussion here, and we'll pick up uh, with the next module.